Good morning and welcome to Parkway United Church of Christ. We're grateful that you've chosen to be with us in our open and affirming congregation. All are accepted, no exceptions. We strive for limitless love, courageous action, and spirited inquiry. We hope you'll stay after this worship experience for some announcements and then for our adult education speaker series. For now, we invite you to take some deep breaths. You might even wanna close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so. Some deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. As we focus on a gift of peace. And we invite you as you receive peace to share that same gift of peace with others. For we need more peace in our homes, in our neighborhoods, around the area and across the globe. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ move through you. Amen.
Please join us in our call to worship. Faith is patience in the night, waiting for the morning light, never giving up the fight. Faith is laughter in our pain, joy in pleasures that remain, trust in one we can't explain. Faith is steadfast will to live, standing firm and positive, being ready still to give. Faith is courage under stress, confidence in hopelessness, greatest gift we can possess. Please join us in our opening prayer, which we are borrowing from one of our sibling congregations, First Congregational United Church of Christ in Memphis. We will be together. We will stand as brothers and sisters giving life by one God. We will be together. We will watch out for one another. We will listen to what needs to be said in a spirit of compassion. We will respect the power of silence. We will wait for the slowest. We will sooner or later catch up with the fastest. We will dry the tears of those who are weeping and know that they will dry ours when the time comes. We will let ourselves begin to feel at least a little of the pain of those we have considered our enemies. We will entrust our stories to each other. We will not be skeptical that peace can come. We will not forget the joy of life. We will not forget to be grateful. We will do our best to stir in each other hope, courage, and faith. Amen. I'm not sure if you've ever been on a boat. I grew up by the water and spent a fair amount of time on boats. And so the movement of the water, the movement of the boat doesn't really bother me. I don't know about you, your experience of boats. I don't know about your experience of summer. I know that the summer probably did not go the way that you had expected, the way that you had hoped that it was gonna go. I know I was supposed to spend some time at the water. I was supposed to spend some time with my family at the beach, at the ocean, outside of Boston, where I grew up. But that was not something that we ended up doing this summer. And so I thought maybe I'd just spend a little time in this boat and remember those days. Actually, the reason I decided to get in this boat today is to talk to you a little bit about a couple of times when Jesus was in the boat with the disciples and there were great storms, big waves, difficult things happening and they were afraid. The first time the disciples and Jesus were in the boat, um, they didn't use Uber, you know, and they were in the boat and Jesus was asleep. Um, he worked hard and he was tired and so he took a nap. And some of the other disciples were awake and this storm started. It seemed like it came out of nowhere and the winds were whipping and the waves were whipping and they were kind of getting tossed all around the boat and Jesus was still asleep. And so they couldn't believe it. And so they woke him up and they said, Jesus, don't you care that this storm is scaring us that we might perish that something bad might happen because of this storm and Jesus stood up and said to the winds and the waves be still and the storm stopped the big waves stopped another time the disciples were in the boat this time Jesus wasn't with them he was on the mountain praying because he also needed alone time remember we talked about that last Sunday about alone time and how important that is for all of us. 
And so the disciples were in the boat, and the storm came again, and the winds and the waves hit, and they were getting tossed around on the boat, and they were afraid. And suddenly they saw something strange. They thought it was a ghost walking on the water. It was late at night and dark and mysterious out there on the water. And so they were afraid, and they screamed. And Jesus said, be encouraged. Have peace. Relax. It's okay, it's me. And he walked all the way on the water to them and got in the boat with them. And when that happened, the waves and the wind stopped and there was calm again. And so I wanted to remind you and to remind myself that sometimes when we're afraid, sometimes when things seem unsteady, sometimes when there's storms and winds and waves or whatever it is that makes us afraid, Jesus is right there in the boat with us, and maybe we just have to remember that and kind of wake him up and say, encourage me, give me confidence, give me peace. Other times, sometimes we are so afraid and so freaked out and so just shaky that we don't see Jesus around at all. And so that's when we look. That's when we have to look up. From inside of our boat, we have to look around and see Jesus is coming, God is coming, the Holy Spirit is coming to give us the calm that we need to help us to feel safe and confident, calm, peaceful, even when there are great storms, even when we are afraid of things. So sometimes Jesus is right there and we can see him, and other times we have to look around, we have to kind of wait and be patient and watch, but trust that he's going to come, and that God is going to come, and the Spirit is going to come and help us to be calm, help us to find peace, and help us to give calm and to give peace to others. Please pray with us. Holy One, we thank you for the water. We thank you for boats. We thank you for friends and family. We thank you for all the things that we are doing this summer. And we thank you for giving us calm and peace, even when we are uncomfortable, even when we are scared and afraid, even when things seem difficult to bear. And so help us to know, God, that you never leave us, and that you might be right there beside us, or maybe we just have to look around a little bit to see you, and to feel your calm, to feel your peace, to feel your love. Help us, O oh God, to give peace, to give calm, to give love to each other, especially to the people who are afraid, especially to the people who feel tossed around by winds and waves. Amen. Lots of fond memories of the good folks uh, who are members of the congregation and it's a privilege to be with you now sharing scripture to read about Peter walking on water I wanted to be near some water so I'm near the Hubble Creek in Jackson Missouri where I live and serve Emmanuel United Church of Christ and uh, I just can't help but remember that in the news a couple months ago there was a little girl who was swept away by these waters and being only five uh, was unable to help herself but an 11 year old boy 
uh, heroically went to her rescue, wasn't strong enough to rescue her alone, and uh, two 15-year-olds helped the 11-year-old boy save the 5-year-old. And so I celebrate that there was someone answering the call and essentially walking on water uh, right here just a couple months ago and they were just very young people. So I share Matthew 14 verses 22 to 23. Right then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. Evening came, and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat, fighting a strong headwind, was being battered by the waves and was already far away from land. Very early in the morning, he came to his disciples walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, They were so frightened, they screamed. Just then, Jesus spoke to them, Be encouraged. It's me. Don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened. As he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, rescue me! Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, You man of weak faith, why did you begin to have doubts? When they got into the boat, the wind settled down. Then those in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, You must be God's Son. Holy One, be with us as we seek truth and guidance from the words of Scripture. Be with us as we listen to the stories of others who have gone before us, as we watch the disciples, as we wait with them, as we learn with them, as we grow with them, as we're challenged with them. Help us to see our lives unfolding in similar ways with theirs. Learning to trust, asking you questions, partnering with you, walking with you, wondering with you, being engaged in mystery and unknowing with you. Holy One, help us to feel more and more connected 
with the stories of yesterday, for the stories of your people continue, and they overlap, and they lean on each other, and they encourage each other, and inspire each other. They set one another free. They provide tenderness and strength. And so be with us as we hear again in our minds, bodies, spirits, and relationships a particular story that you have given to us in the Gospels. Amen. Well, there's a lot of action going on in this Gospel lesson. We just pulled out two of them to lift up as a sermon title, although there's a lot more going on. We're thinking about sinking and we're thinking about rising. But we're also thinking about a number of other things that happened in this story that surely connect with you and your story. There might be these things of action happening today for you and around you and through you. There is praying today. Jesus is up on the mountain by himself praying. Praying about what has happened and praying because he's anticipating what's going to happen next. We picked up today with the gospel lesson right after last Sunday's gospel lesson ended. You remember that Jesus had been alone praying because he was grief-stricken because of the horrific death of his cousin John the Baptist. And then the crowds came because they wanted a piece of Jesus. They wanted to know him and hear him and be a part of his spirit. And so the crowds gathered, and at the end of the day, after he spent time with them, talking with them, telling them stories, encouraging them, helping them to understand a little bit more about God and how they fit into God's life and God's love, they were hungry, and the disciples said, it's the end of a long day, Jesus. Send them away so that they can go into the villages to get food. But Jesus said, no, you feed them. And the disciples didn't know what to make of that. And then they were able to find three loaves of bread and two fish. And through miracle, Jesus multiplied that food so that there was enough and leftovers for the people. Now, the numbers say that there were about 5,000, but we know that they counted differently then because different people counted and some people didn't count at all. But now we know that the numbers were much, much higher than the 5,000 reported in this story. And then we pick up to today where Jesus tells the disciples to go on ahead of him in the boat to go across the big lake. And he goes back up to the mountaintop to pray. Maybe he wasn't done praying before, or maybe he wanted to pray about what he just experienced with all of those people, the crowds and the stories and the loaves and fish multiplying. Or maybe he went up to the mountain by himself to pray because he knew what was unfolding. Or because he knew that whatever it was that was next for him and the disciples, he would need to be rooted and grounded and ready. And so he went off to the top of the mountain to pray. And then a storm comes. It's a windy, wavy storm. And the disciples are out there in the boat. And so we know that there is storming today. And I hear the echoes of the song, the wise one built their house upon the rock, as I imagine the winds and the waves beating against that boat. But the wind was working against them, and so they weren't able to move forward the way that they wanted to, and they didn't want to go backwards because they were there in the middle. They were far from land, either side of where they started and where they were going. And sometimes we know that the unavoidable natural elements get in our way and there is storming. We've heard about storms this week. And then there are those human-made storms that can be avoided. The bombing in Beirut. This is the weekend where we remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Storms that are person-made, human-made that we can avoid. And sometimes the human-made storms are self-inflicted. And so we become both the creator of the storm and the victim of the storm. There is fearing today. I don't need to tell you that. There's fear rampant, especially because of the pandemic. And throughout the Bible, part of our human story is that people are afraid. A couple of you mentioned to me after our Christmas in July service a couple of weeks ago how encouraged you were to remember that all of the characters in the Nativity story were afraid, and yet the messengers from God, the angels, came and told them repeatedly, do not be afraid. You are not alone. The name that 
the angel told Joseph to be sure to give to the baby was Emmanuel, which means God with us. Do not be afraid, you are not alone. But if we're paying attention, there are things to be afraid of. And so the disciples are authentic in their fear in that boat, and we are authentic when we experience fears far from the land, unsure of what's happened next, the wind coming at us. And so because they're frightened, they scream out. And we do particular things when we are afraid. There is doubting today. I'm not sure why God made doubt a part of the human condition, but maybe it has something to do with free will and that God doesn't control us, right? And so there's free will, and so there's doubt, and so there's celebration, and so there's joy, and so there's brokenness. We can't know all there is to know. And if we find we have a certain grasp on who we are and how things are going and feeling controlled and feeling in charge and feeling whole, it doesn't always stay that feeling for long. Jesus points out to the disciples that they had little faith. He does that a few times. He tells them about their doubting. And I appreciate that reminder that doubting has been part of our story all along. Doubt is part of our faith. And I don't feel like Jesus is mocking the disciples, although sometimes when I hear him in the gospel saying these things, it makes me feel like he's belittling them. He says, your faith is weak. Why did you begin to have doubts? But maybe he said it more compassionately. Your faith is weak. Why do you have these doubts? Maybe he was trying to connect with them and bring them some tenderness and some compassion. Later, we're going to sing a song. Many of you love it and request it all the time that says, I will come to you in the silence. I will lift you from all your fear. You will hear my voice. I claim you as my choice. Be still and know I am near. There is encouraging today. Jesus comes right into that storm, right into that fear with the disciples to offer them encouragement, to offer them courage, to give them buoyancy, to give them strength. One of our quotes from early on in the worship bulletin today said, If grace is an ocean, then we're all sinking. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. You're not alone is the message that Jesus gives to the disciples when he walks through the storm on the water to meet them where they are. Emmanuel, God with us. It's what we're saying and doing when we participate in Give a Meal Sunday, when we bring gifts of underwear and socks for kids that are going back to school, when we are involved in the Alzheimer's Walk and the Crop Walk and Pride Fest and Black Lives Matter marches. We're telling each other, you are not alone. You can be encouraged. You can trust that you are not alone. And then Peter says, as he is in the boat, still being hit by the winds and the waves, as he figures out that it's Jesus who's walking on the water, Peter says, order me to come to you on the water. So Peter is saying to Jesus, order me to trust you. Order me to do this. Tell me to risk and be vulnerable and be available. Pull me into this presence of yours. Pull me into this promise that you make me. Call me to walk on the water with you. Peter was asking for a pep talk. He didn't just jump up and walk out on the water, but he said, order me to walk to you. You can see that from the holy. You can see that from one another, that we need these pep talks and these encouragements. There is walking today, right into the storm. Sometimes we're stronger than we think. Sometimes we have more abilities than we think, and we can walk right into the storm. Jesus said to Peter, come. Short, simple, clear, come. Jesus didn't stop the storm from happening, but he told Peter, come. You can deal with this storm. I saw a t-shirt a couple weeks ago that I loved. It said, they whispered to her, you cannot withstand the storm. She whispered back, I am the storm. It actually was a t-shirt for an old lady, it said. They whispered to her, you cannot withstand the storm. And she whispered back, I am the storm. There is strength when we walk. There's strength when we walk forward. Sometimes just walk, walking forward is what you have to do to participate, 
to have an active role rather than just cower in the boat. You can't cross the sea merely by standing and staring at the water. That was another one of our quotes from the beginning. You can't cross the sea merely by standing and staring at the water. Many people have been doing a lot of walking during these last few months. It's so good for your body, your mind, your spirit, and relationships. And so I want to ask you now to come on a walk with me. I'm really excited about this because for years I've been inviting you to think about the labyrinth walks. And so I want to have you come with me now to a few different places around here that have a labyrinth. This is the labyrinth right next door at Missouri Baptist Hospital. You can see with the steeple up there how close we are. So a little bit about labyrinths. They've been around for over 4,000 years and are found in just about every major religious tradition in the world. They've been an integral part of many cultures such as Native American, Greek, Celtic, and Mayan. The Hopi called the labyrinth a symbol for Mother Earth and equated it with the Kiva. Like Stonehenge and the pyramids, they're magical geometric forms that defined sacred space. They were once used to symbolically represent the pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Today, labyrinths are being used for reflection and meditation and prayer and comfort. They're found in many sizes and shapes and are created in sand, cornmeal, flour, painted on canvas, fashioned with masking tape or string for a temporary design or built in a permanent fashion from stones, cut into turf, formed by mounds of earth, made from vegetation or any other natural material. Many people make the mistake of thinking a labyrinth and a maze are the same, but a maze has dead ends and trick turns. A labyrinth has only one path leading to the center and then back out again. There are no dead ends. This is the labyrinth at Congregation Sheremeth, the Reformed Jewish synagogue just up the street at the corner of Ballas and Ledoux, one of our very close interfaith partners. When you walk a labyrinth, you meander back and forth, turning 180 degrees each time you enter a different circuit. As you shift your direction, you also shift your awareness from right brain to left brain. This is one of the reasons the labyrinth can induce receptive states of consciousness. It can also help to balance the chakras. Each person's walk is a personal experience. How one walks and what one receives differs with each walk. Some people use the walk for clearing the mind and centering. Others enter with a question or a concern. The time in the center can be used for receiving, reflecting, meditating, or praying, as well as discovering our own sacred inner space. What each person receives can be integrated on the walk out. Your walk can be a healing and sometimes very profound experience or it can just be a pleasant walk. Each time, it's different. This is the outdoor labyrinth at the Mercy Center, the Roman Catholic Retreat Center that's just a few miles away. It's on Geyer Road. So the recommendation is that before you enter the labyrinth, you stop and relax and breathe deeply at the entrance. You may want to set an intention for yourself before beginning. And then you walk slowly, following the winding path toward the center. And you release any busy thoughts or concerns or burdens of any sort. And as your body moves in a peaceful rhythm of contemplation, you become more aware of God's active presence. It may meet a fellow traveler on the path. Simply step aside and pass with reverence. In the center, there are tree stumps that you can sit on. There are other beautiful things to look at and some wind chimes to listen to. You can sit there, pause a bit, focus your attention on the holy. And then when you leave the center, you come back out the same way that you went in and you offer whatever other prayers or make yourself open um, to whatever the holy wants to share with you. Some people go in with scripture or a concern or a question or a person or a predicament on their mind and you are bathed in that. Other times you get a new thought or idea or something from the past or something from out in front of you that's calling to you. Each 
experience is unique, each labyrinth setting is unique. Thank you for joining us on those labyrinth walks. I'm delighted that we were able to bring you to those places and I hope that maybe sometime in the future you might go there again on your own. Um, it is safe to do so. There is encouragement at all of those places to wear a mask if there are other people around, but you can probably find a time when it's not um, used by someone else, but you might want to do that walking. There's also a labyrinth in one of our UCC churches here in St. Louis. It's in Florissant. It's at Zion UCC. And the beauty of that setting is that the labyrinth itself is wide enough that wheelchairs can make their way around the labyrinth. Just wanted to let you know that there are also, from time to time, labyrinths that are on canvases that are laid out in large spaces. And sometimes during that opportunity to walk the labyrinth, there's piano music and candles, maybe a harpist. Beautiful opportunities happen not just outside, uh, but inside as well. There are organizations that set up canned goods as the perimeter for the labyrinth walk. There are also times when people um, use their hands, their fingers, and they do the fingerprint, finger tracing labyrinth. If you'd like a copy of one of those, let me know, I'd be delighted to send it to you. Walking. Peter was actually walking on the water. Jesus was his inspiration. Peter wanted to do what Jesus did. He often wanted to do and say the things that Jesus was able to say and do, and so he was able to walk on that water. We know that there's also sinking today. You saw the front of the bulletin. It says, when all seems lost. There are those moments, those times, maybe even those seasons when we feel lost, like we're sinking. We backslide from being confident and competent and feeling full of faith. We're not always able to stay focused, to keep our consistency. We can get knocked off center. Sometimes storms change course, and so we didn't quite expect the storm to happen that way. We had gotten a hold of ourselves in the midst of the storm. Sometimes different storms come from directions that we hadn't expected. Sometimes they wear us down because the storm keeps going on and on, relentless. Human rights crises are what are talked about on the back of the bulletin. Maybe you saw that. Human trafficking and other exploitations. We've been experiencing a roller coaster of conversation about equality about women's rights, about ONA, open and affirming, LGBTQIA rights, about Black Lives Matter. This is the sixth anniversary today of Michael Brown's death. And sometimes it can feel deep and murky and the swirling of the storms in the water continue to keep us off course. We can feel like we're sinking. There is sinking today. There's also rising today. Peter is drowning, and he cries out, Rescue me! And Jesus immediately grabs him and saves him. Someone was paying attention to Peter. Someone saw him going under and didn't ask him questions about why he was there in the middle of the storm, why he was out on the water, why he was involved in whatever he was involved in, but what happened was someone just saw that there was a need, saw that someone was sinking, and reached out and grabbed them. It didn't matter who the person was or what their position was or what their predicament was. There would be time for conversation later, but immediately, immediately, which is one of those great words in the Gospel of Matthew, immediately Jesus reaches out to Peter and pulls him up out of that water. We are meant to help each other. We are meant to support each other. We are meant to encourage one another. One of you told me this story. When I was five years old, I contracted measles encephalitis, resulting in my being in a coma, hospitalized for several weeks, and then being brought home when there was no more that they could do. I vaguely remember waking briefly and seeing a nurse who was a family friend at my bedside. She looked like an angel to me. Then I went back into unconsciousness. Some two and a half months later, I woke up with my grandmother holding my hand. My recovery was the result of many, many prayers from family, friends, and church members. 
The associate pastor apparently visited every few days. That is a true miracle. Jesus doesn't always calm the waters. Sometimes Jesus comes to us in the midst of that sinking and helps us to rise. You've probably heard the story about God trying to help someone three different times and they wouldn't receive the help. Someone was stuck on their roof in the middle of the flood and praying that God would help them. Someone came by in a motorboat and said, jump in, I'll help you. And they said, no, I'm praying to God, I'm waiting for God to come to help me. Someone came by in a rowboat and said, jump in, I'll help you. And the person said, no, I'm praying to God, I'm waiting for God to come. A helicopter came by, let down its rope and said, grab onto the rope, I'm here to help you and save you. And the person said, no, I'm praying to God, God will help me. And then when the person dies, God has a conversation with them and they're not very happy about God not helping them. And God says, I sent you three different opportunities to receive help. There is trusting today. And when you trust, sometimes it's not really about the moment that you're in. Sometimes the trusting happens because you remember other times when things turned out all right. Earlier today, when I was in the boat here, we talked about two stories of Jesus and the storms out on the water. One is the gospel lesson we shared today. The other is a story where there was a great storm and the disciples and Jesus were in the boat and he was asleep and they woke him up and he calmed the storm down. So this story that we have today is several chapters after the one about Jesus asleep on the boat. So the disciples trusted. There was that movement of trust in them because they had had an experience earlier with Jesus on the lake, in the boat, in the middle of a storm. One of you told me, two separate times during boot camp, my direct prayers were quickly answered. I had lost all hope and feared for my sanity. Each of the two times, I lay in my bed before going to sleep and begged God for relief from a specific situation. Each time, early the next day, the situation was miraculously solved. 52 years later, I can still recall those direct responses from God as proof of God's presence in my life. And so recalling those moments 52 years ago, building trust upon how things worked out in the past. Another of you shared a grief story with me. After my husband died, I went to Florida to get away and heal. The last morning before I came home to St. Louis, I went for a final walk up the beach. A storm was brewing. Suddenly I looked down and a large, beautiful, unusually colored conch shell washed up at my feet. I picked it up, looked to the sky, and felt a sense of peace, as if God was saying to me, you're not alone. God was with me and I knew I would be okay. What has helped you in times in the past when you didn't think you could get through something, but you did? Maybe there are things that Jesus said and did that you've tried and you've had some, some initial, initial success and then it was too hard to continue, too hard to sustain those words and actions of Jesus. Peter focused on the example of Jesus walking on the water in the middle of the storm and he was able to do the same thing, Peter with confidence. But Peter noticed that the wind didn't stop and the waves were still beating and the danger was real to him again and he got off track and he got off focus and he began to sink. I wonder what would have happened if Jesus had said, look at me, you're gonna be okay. Look at me, come. Just that simple word again, come out onto the water. Jesus used this moment to remind Peter that he wasn't alone. And I'm sure if Peter is like any of us, that could echo forward. And so that trust, that relationship, that security that Jesus gave Peter on the water, and when he pulled him out of the water, is something that would echo with him. Because we remember where we've been. We remember the successes that we've had. We remember the faith that bore out in the past. Psalmists often proclaim to God, I remember your wonders of old. I remember your wonders of old. I have a treasure of stories of trusting you, of the things that you did to come through, the things that you did so that I knew that I was not alone. Parting of the Red Sea is a story that is shared often in the Psalms. 
Wouldn't that have been a better way, I'm sure Peter thought, to still the storm and just create some dry land for me to walk on instead of me having to walk on that stormy water? We think about Noah. We think about Moses' mother as she built that little basket with bitumen and pitch. We think about Jonah. We think about the still waters of the 23rd Psalm. We think about the Samaritan woman at the well. There is trusting. There is trust building when we hear these stories and when we go through these stories ourselves. And there is faith over fear. Trusting doesn't mean that there is no fear. It just means that the faith is over the fear. The faith can cover the fear. It can push it out. It can allow us to move forward with confidence and to trust, even though... Dot, dot, dot. There is worshiping today. When they got in the boat, finally, Peter and Jesus joining the other disciples, the wind settled down and the people in the boat worshiped Jesus and they said, you must be God's son. They've already said that earlier in the gospel, but they were reminded again of this truth and they could celebrate. They were overwhelmed with this experience that caused them to give thanks and caused them to worship. The other disciples that witnessed what Peter and Jesus were engaged in had already seen other things that Jesus had done and his other interactions with people. Last weekend, when we were across the street in the historic sanctuary, we talked about some scripture passages that are often shared in that setting at memorial services and funerals. One of them was Romans 8, talking about the confidence that we can have, that we are never separate from God. Earlier this week, I was on that Taze worship experience with the Open and Affirming Coalition, available at 8 a.m. and 11 a.m., Monday through Friday, and the scripture of the day was Romans 8. And I immediately felt connected to it, and I felt reassured by it, a scripture passage that I know well, but I was reminded of it in a context of a worship service. And so there are other things that we might say to ourselves in a worshipful space so that we can be solidified in this trusting and in this worshiping. You might try this. Grant me a calm spirit and a trusting heart. You might say to yourself over and over again or spread out throughout a day or the evening, create in me a calm spirit and a trusting heart. Grant me a calm spirit and a trusting heart. Grant me a calm spirit and a trusting heart. When we get together for worship, we sing, we share stories, we support one another, we pray, we engage in acts of kindness, we lean on each other, we listen intently, we walk together as individuals and as a community. A little bit differently these days, I know. Because there's danger, because there are storms, because there's wind and waves, and because there is the holy, and because there is community, and because there is faith over fear, and because there is trusting, and because there is rising, and because we can look back and stand sturdy because of the places that we have been in the past with God. You may have noticed that this pyramid uh, was the one featured on the side of the boat. And it is itself a boat. And it reminds us of the storms that we might encounter, but also reminds us of this journey that we are on with God. Maybe you noticed already that this UCC symbol uh, in the circle, Naomi Runtz created this, and we're praying for her healing after her knee replacement surgery. This comma is a part of who we are because we know that God is still speaking. This comma also to me looks like Mary maybe looking down at baby Jesus or Joseph looking at Jesus. It also reminds me of waves and of wind and of a storm. And it looks like someone is strong and sturdy in the middle of all that. And that when we're called to be engaged in a just world for all, we are offering our gifts so that people can trust, so that people can remember that they're not alone, so that people can stand strong and sturdy. Well, I marvel at so many of you because you've let me in and told me some stories about your life. And it's your faith that builds faith in me. We have a new song before us today. It's called Faith is Patient in the Night. We snuck the lyrics into the call to worship and you'll be singing those soon. And it goes like this. Faith is patience in the night. 
waiting for the morning light, never giving up the fight. Faith is laughter in our pain, joy in pleasures that remain, trust in one we can't explain. Faith is steadfast will to live, standing firm and positive, being ready still to give. Faith is courage under stress, confidence in hopelessness, greatest gift we can possess. It's our hope that you look back at these lyrics and the other lyrics in today's worship experience and that you look at the meditations that were listed at the top of the bulletin for more encouragement, for more bathing in the spirit, for more opportunities to trust and to build that firm foundation that you can rely on, that you can live from, that you can share with others. Amen. This book, called Emerge, Blessings and Rituals for Unsheltering, was written by some of our still-speaking authors that many of you hear from each day when you receive your daily devotion from our United Church of Christ. Ginny mentioned a couple of minutes ago some of the gifts that are coming through the denomination with OCWM, Our Church's Wider Mission, 
This is one of the gifts that all clergy in the denomination received recently to help sustain us and encourage us and so that we might share some of these gifts with you. Today I want to share a piece called Hymn for Waiting in Faith When Noah Sent a Dove to Fly. You'll recall that after the floods, Noah sent a dove out to see what was going on out in the land, and the dove came back the first time with nothing, apparently did not have a place to land. A week later, Noah sent the dove again. This time it came back with a freshly plucked leaf from an olive tree. The third time the dove went out, it did not come back because it didn't need to come back because it found what it needed and was ready to start a new life. So here we have him for waiting in faith when Noah sent a dove to fly by Mary Ludi. I'm blessed that she was one of my seminary professors. When Noah sent a dove to fly across the ebbing sea to seek a sign of life's return, he waited patiently. Not knowing if she'd find a thing, he waited patiently and prayed the dove along her way toward unknown mystery. And as she winged her way on prayer toward unknown mystery, already you had freed the land and planted olive trees. Already as she circled high, you've planted olive trees. Already made the branch should take its green and silver leaves. Already made new earth a jewel of green and silver leaves. While Noah still in patience prayed, still scanned the cloud and breeze. Our patient prayers are like the dove that scans through clouds and breeze for signs that in foreseeing love you're planting olive trees. We hope she'll bring a branch, but more, we ask for faith to know that while we're praying unaware, the trees you're planting grow. We don't know what's happening in the Spirit when we are praying. And so this is a beautiful reminder that God is at work when we are praying. God might be planting olive trees. God might be causing the leaf to unfold. God might be giving gifts of peace to someone, even in the midst of tumult, even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of illness or grief. God might be giving the gift of peace even as we're praying. And as we pray today, God might also be reminding people that we are to be gift givers. When peace is needed, we are invited to bring the words, to bring the actions, to bring our non-anxious presence, to just be there with people, that they might lean on us or be encouraged by us or be warmed or blessed by us just because we are carrying the gift of peace. And so as we move into our time of prayer together, we share in one another's lives the burdens and the blessings. We reach out and listen to one another tell our stories. We unpack them for one another and we buoy one another up. And so pray with us. Holy One, we thank you that you are always at work, even when we are unaware. We give you thanks that the dove eventually found peace in that olive branch and brought that to Noah. We, too, want to be peacemakers, peace givers, and so send us out that we might recognize where peace is needed that we might bring words of comfort and reassurance and blessing, that we might sometimes just sit silently with each other, observing the peace that can be, the peace that you give us, not as the world gives, but the peace that you give us that is lasting and gives us roots and gives us wings. And God, as we pray our prayers of concern, recognizing needs and hungers and thirsts and pains of others, we also recognize that we have been the recipient of incredible gifts 
in one another, in our beautiful memories, in our hopes and dreams for tomorrow. And so God, even as we have been praying together in these moments, we recognize that you have been doing things. You have been active. You have been planting trees. You have been growing trees. You have been extending olive branches. You have been moving about freely with the Spirit. Help us to notice. Help us to be swept up in that gift of your presence and share it abundantly with others, especially those who are watching and waiting for a sign of peace and presence, looking for perseverance, looking to know that they are not alone. And God, in our constant eagerness to be filled by you, inspired and encouraged and sent by you, Hear us as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Greetings, Parkway United Church of Christ. On behalf of all UCC churches in Arkansas, Memphis, and Missouri, I bring you greetings this morning. You may see my background, and uh, this is actually chalk art that my nine-year-old uh, niece, Maddie Ann, created uh, when she went camping with my parents. And when my mom sent me the picture, I immediately knew that this reflects who God has called me to be as a minister and my love for my family. So I give you thanks for all that you do that offers the pride of God's love in inclusion and justice and equity throughout St. Louis and all of God's creation. I give thanks this day for your contribution and immense generosity to our church's wider mission during 2019. Your gift of $17,000 has benefited us in this year of two deadly pandemics so that we can provide immense resources to our churches and our authorized ministers as we all lived through COVID-19 pandemic and the pandemic of white supremacy. Because of your generosity, our ministers, we have been able to meet once a week on Tuesday mornings to offer safe space for them to process and listen and pray and be prayed for in that way. The same way your generosity has enabled our chaplains to come together once a week on Tuesday evenings. We have been providing a weekly webinar since March when the pandemic started that provides resources to our lay members and our ministers as well related to the pandemics. Because of your generosity, we have been able to provide 20% uh, of OCWM uh, contributions which go to the national setting of the United Church of Christ as they are providing immense resources during these pandemics as well. Because of your generosity, we have been able to provide support to Camp Moval and to Shenandoah Outdoor Ministries. This is a difficult and important moment in our collective ministry together as God continues to call us to live into our goodness and worth of who God created us to be and have pride that we are God's beloved community called to care for one another. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and give thanks in it. Amen. God continues to call us into goodness and mercy. God continues to call us to be goodness and mercy for others. You might remember the 23rd Psalm that tells us that God is always following us, chasing us all the days of our lives with goodness and mercy. And so we're encouraged to be those gifts for others, not just goodness and mercy, but peace and hospitality and compassion and forgiveness and warmth of every kind. And so as we invite you to be engaged in acts of gift giving, we invite you to remember those people who during your life, long ago, yesterday and tomorrow, will be catching up with you with gifts of goodness and mercy, hospitality and warmth forgiveness, listening, and love beyond measure. May it be so.
Please join us in our prayer of dedication. We make our offerings, small and large, with the hope and confidence that all we do, all we offer, all we say, all we think, and all we hope will take root in this world and be the source of new expressions of God's love, of God's justice, of God's character, of God's mission, and of God's kingdom. May God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, through us, alongside us, despite us, and for us. Amen. And as we go from this place into the week, whether it has storms or calm or a mix, may you feel the love of God going with you, the peace of Christ being inside of you, and the comfort and reassurances of the Holy Spirit swirling around you. Amen. Thanks again for spending time with us in worship in our open and affirming congregation where all are accepted, no exceptions. We strive for limitless love, courageous action, and spirited inquiry. In a few moments, we hope that you will join us on YouTube for a pre-recorded adult education speaker series with Harold Cobb. 
It's called Confessions of a Book Disciple. He has a great passion for books. He always has a few books going, and he has strong credentials then to know what's a good read and what's not. We hope that you'll join us. There are lots of opportunities for this coming week. Uh, we email those out on Friday or Saturday. If you did not get a copy of that, let us know. There are opportunities for children and teenagers and adults, opportunities for worship and for study and for fellowship. If you have ideas, let us know. Midweek, Wednesday evenings at 5 o'clock, a brief experience of worship, about 15 or 20 minutes worth, um, goes up on YouTube. And it's piano and it's scripture and quotes and hymn lyrics. It's a great opportunity in the middle of the week to find centering and grounding again. This week is also a TED week, Tuesday Evening Dialogue. They're going to be talking about the James Baldwin book, If Beale Street Could Talk. There's more information in your bulletin about that, as well as our Give a Meal, where we invite you to share gifts of non-perishable food items for hungry neighbors. We're continuing through next week to ask you to bring new socks or underwear or Target gift cards for shoes for kids that are going back to school. Those things can be dropped off just between our main two sets of doors. If you don't have the code, let me know and we'll get that for you. Also in the bulletin, you can read about the final decision for the crop walk this fall to be a virtual walk. Some news from the Alzheimer's Association through our Joyce Ruiz. And it's talking about the flu and pneumonia vaccinations uh, showing that there's a reduced risk for Alzheimer's because of those. Habitat for Humanity St. Louis has some information in our bulletin through Tom McKenzie. Life classes at Eden Seminary this fall will be on Zoom and will be engaged in conversations around the Psalms, around missional leadership, and around pastoral care. We continue to ask for your help with clean up, fix up, and paint up. We're inviting people to come on their own and spend time in one of our rooms to get it prepared for our next renters. We do have someone that we are in early conversations with and we hope that that will come to fruition. And one last thing we want to remind you that we would love to hear from you as we go further into August, worship preparation. If you have words of poetry, scripture, quotes, prayers that have been very meaningful to you in your life, that have given you healing and hope and blessing and grace and encouragement, we'd like to hear from you about the women in the Bible that have been significant for you. We'd like to hear a story about how you put your faith into action in your work life, in your personal life, in your professional life. If you're able to send me a few notes about those, I would greatly appreciate it. Again, thank you for choosing to be with us and we hope that you will be in our adult education speaker series in just a couple of moments. Peace be with you.